If you enjoy these programs, please like and subscribe. They're completely different than our infancy narrative. In fact, the infancy narratives are so um, different in Matthew and Luke that it makes the passion narratives look cohesive in comparison. So, color your live on the air. Please tell us your name, where you're calling from. Hello, gentlemen. My name is Igor, and I'm from Lisbon, Portugal. Third time participating. Second one could be Rabbi Tovia Singer, who I appreciate the opportunity to answer. My question that has to do with the figure of Mary in the book of Luke. In chapter 1, from verses 28 to 38, we read the angel Gabriel saying that Mary is blessed among women, even leaving her intrigued by the bow of the greeting. The angel Gabriel, as God's messenger, seems quite fascinated to be in her presence. Soon after, he presents the news that she will give birth to Jesus, saying that he will be great. In other words, Gabriel seems to be trying to persuade Mary to accept the deal, which she ends up doing. We don't see her objecting, and it's not suggested that she had no choice. That is, it is not written that she had no free will and was bound to accept. Since Christianity claims that Jesus is not only the Messiah, but also God himself, would it not be possible to conclude from this that implicitly the New Testament is saying that Mary is even more powerful than God because she seems to be the only one capable of aborting God if she uses her free will. If it weren't for Mary, whom God needs to the detriment of all other women to have this essence carried by her womb, there would be no Jesus, there would be no salvation, and she could even have killed God by abortion. So don't Catholics have an argument over evangelicals about Mary if we use the New Testament as a reference? And also, Rabbi, what does the Jewish scripture say about what the Messiah's mother will know about him before his birth. Thank you for your question. From Lisbon, from the birthplace of the Abarbanel. Thank you so much. Thank you, sweet child of Hashem. So you know what Tanakh says about the mother of Mashiach? Nothing. That's how. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> absolutely nothing. And it's absolutely correct that the Roman Catholic Church derives its high view of Mary from the highest view of Mary found in the canonical texts. The view of Mary as a theotokos didn't come out of nowhere. So it, it comes really from Luke. And Luke does a lot to amp up Mary's status, the Annunciation at the end of chapter 1. It's, there's nothing else like it anywhere in the Christian Bible. In fact, John wants to do the opposite of the author of Luke, whereas Luke seeks to elevate Mary because it's the mother of God, uh, like you find in other idolatries where God has some sort of mother. John has such a high Christology, I mean, such a high view of Jesus, that the mother actually becomes a problem, problematic. And the book of John is the only gospel where Mary's name is not even mentioned by name. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. There are seven different people in the Christian Bible with the name Mary. So we're talking about Mary, the putative mother of Jesus. So Luke and John are precisely opposite because whereas John is seeking to diminish the value of Mary, and in fact when we're introduced to Mary in John, she is spoken to derisively and Jesus asks her, what do I have to do with you at the wedding in Cana when there is only water and not wine? Notice how strikingly different that is from um, from the book of Luke. So Luke wants to elevate Mary, and you're indeed correct. 
that's the highest view of Mary. And in fact, the very words that you articulated in this Annunciation is part of the liturgy in both the Eastern Church and the Western Church, meaning in the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. The very infancy narrative itself makes up the words that are expressed in these two iterations of idolatry. There are other books that elevate Mary. The most important is the Proto-Gospel of James, probably written about 100 years after the book of Luke, so it's second century. And the Proto-Gospel of James is an example of a non-canonical book that is more important or was had a greater impact on the way Christians thought than many books in the Christian Bible. And the Proto-Gospel of James is given to elevating Mary further. So it's Luke's Annunciation, but amped up, amped up. It says, avoid the it says idolatry of worshiping Mary or venerating Mary, praying to Mary. And in Luke, and it's the only book like this, that claims that Mary was actually cousins with Elizabeth, which means that Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins in only in the book of Luke. You won't find that anywhere else. Now, John the Baptist was a very prominent real figure in the first century. He was a very real figure, and he was a, a celebrity. For Luke to connect Jesus with John the Baptist by family, that was not an accident. That was a device to elevate Jesus and Mary because of their family with a very famous person, John the Baptist, who's eventually executed. But he's a very big figure, very big figure. And he features widely in the Gospels. Big, big guy. But he is, John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus only in the Synoptic Gospels. And he comes to say, I'm not even worthy of baptizing Jesus because the person who does the baptism is typically greater than the person receiving the baptism, right? And in the Gospels, John is made to say the speech, like I'm not even worthy to tie sandals. The book of John, we have such a high Christology, which means such a high view of Jesus. It's not the Trinity. It's not that. But it's way up there, especially the prologue, the first 18 passages of John 1, that John the Baptist never baptizes Jesus. He's there, but he doesn't. He calls out. He names him the Lamb of God, Jesus so-called only in John 1, 29 and 36. So the author of Luke is responsible for this high view of Mary. The author of Luke did not invent this, but this was part of a, an iteration of Christianity that was developing in one community. We don't know where the book of Luke was written. We don't know who wrote it. It's a, it, it is written anonymously. The inscription that a companion and Paul wrote it is second century. It's much, much later. It's an anonymous book. Whoever wrote it was collecting many sources for this book. The book of Mark, almost all of it appears in the book of Luke. There's another source which we don't have didn't survive independently. Matthew had access to it, and so did Luke. So they, he was using that. And then there's another source, which whoever wrote it, we call him Luke. So whoever wrote it was a highly literate Christian who lived at the end of the first century. He was using that source, and he, was, he edited this all together in the book of Luke, which is collected from all these sources, and also Luke was correcting Matthew. But to come back to your point, the high status of Mary, a object of worship, 
comes from the book of Luke, not other books in the Christian Bible that would not come through. And then it was further amped up by the Proto-Gospel of James, a very early book, non-canonical. Some people thought it might have been, but it, it isn't. And that's what contributes to the worship of Mary, and Catholics don't like to use the word worship Mary, so if they, among mixed companies, they venerate Mary. But it's the same thing. It's all avoid de Zora, in and out. And this is a practice that went on throughout the Levant and beyond, and that is to worship not only the gods, but the mother of God. Because, you know, you can't always talk to the male divine figure. He's way up there. But his mommy, you could talk to her, and then she'll talk to her son. One other point, if you notice in Matthew, it's not Mary that's receiving this information. I'll show you how strong this is. If you notice, for instance, the the dream, like who gets to find out that Mary is a virgin, right? Who's going to conceive? In in the book of Matthew, it's not Mary. There's no enunciation. It's Joseph. Joseph is the one who's getting these dreams. Joseph is the one who the angel is speaking to. He's getting all this information. That's Matthew. So Matthew is very oriented toward Joseph. And Luke, who's getting these? It's not Joseph. It's Mary. So that they're completely different than their infancy narrative. In fact, the infancy narratives are so um, different in Matthew and Luke that it makes the passion narratives look cohesive in comparison. It's a very good question. It's time to offload all that avoid desire. Good luck to you in Portugal, a country steeped in either idolatry or atheism. Stay, stay strong, and please, God, we'll see the coming of the true Mashiach, the Mehera Biomenu, quickly in our time. Thank you. If you enjoy these programs, please like and subscribe. Adon Olah, Asher Malach, B'terem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, בחף צוקות אזי מלך אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נועד